Well, we, um, we're going to be talking today about the very heartbeat, I think, of Jesus' plan, the very core of, of, of who he is and what he expects us to be, because I think sometimes when we, when we exchange our old life for Christ's new one, and we come to God, to, to God and we say, God, I have tried religion, perhaps maybe that was your your past it certainly was mine and maybe there are those that are here this morning that you've tried and tried to reach God this was my story or maybe you've tried to modify your behavior as I was coming through reading that Old Testament man I was like man I have got to change some things and I would change and about 37 minutes later you know I'm trying to change again thinking that that would get me in good standing with God and yet when I came to him and, and recognized the words that we just sang, it is finished, that Christ on the cross did a work for us that we could not do for ourselves, that he came and gave himself, that he loved us in our worst moments. He understood all of our closets with all of our skeletons, and he understood the shadows of sin that were in our life, the brokenness, the fractures, the mistakes, the, the failures, all of those things. And the Bible tells us that he absorbed all of those on the cross for us so that we could come and in that moment say, God, this is the life I'm leading and I'm, I'm going to turn it in. I want to exchange it instead of trusting and all of those things like religion or ritual or trying to get right behavior, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not trust in those things any longer, but I'm going to trust alone in Christ 100%. In that moment, and again, maybe you're, you've come today and you're searching for God, I would say to you, don't try it on your own. Don't try to find good standing on God alone, but surrender yourself and surrender your heart and your mind, your life to, to Christ. And in that moment, what happens is so beyond our understanding at so many layers that he begins to, to begin to work in us. He begins to live in us so that it is God working inside out rather than us trying to change our lives from the outside in. We become a child of God at that moment. We become part of the body of Christ. We become, we have this assurance that, that now eternity with God is a reality. So many things that are happening. But if we're not careful in that moment, what can happen is that we are only recipients of all of these amazing things. And when Christ turns around and he, and he takes us in that first moment and almost a, in a sense shakes our hand, what we also realize is that that is the beginning. That is the starting line and not the finish line. It feels like a finish line because we have now finished living the life that we've always lived, and we're like, wow, whew, boy, I'm glad that's over. But when he comes to shake our hands, he reaches in and he, he puts something in there, and I have a running baton today. You see, because Christ said, now the work has begun. Now you're coming off those starting blocks and I have a job for you. What now I have done for you in your own life, you are now to be sent to, do for, to, to share with others. In other words, this message of grace, this message of compassion, of unconditional love from God, man, I couldn't wait to, to, to share it. I was one of those raw Christians that needed to, you know, be rounded a little on the corner. I, you know, I'd buy a uh, Gospel of John's and fill up a whole grocery bag and stand on the corner of, of, uh, uh, in Boston and just really be rude, if I were honest. God had to shape me a little bit, you know, mold a little bit of empathy and a little bit of softness in there. But, man, I was full throttle. As full throttle as I was in playing piano, I went full throttle in following Christ. I recognized that this was because I came a little later in Christ, some, to Christ. Sometimes you, you recognize, man, it's a little bit, there's a, there's a heavy reality there. Here's the way Jesus works. He works like a relay race runner. And we begin today near the end of Jesus' life on, on earth and, he, and, and John chapter 20. And I, wanna, I want to liken his ministry and his strategy to a relay race this morning. In John chapter 20, we see these words. He said, 
Peace be with you, speaking to his disciples. As the Father has sent me, as the Father has put a baton in my hand, I'm putting the baton in your hand. It's fascinating. It's fascinating that the creator of this universe is going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish through us as human beings. The, the God of the universe created things to make more of themselves. In other words, when you read the Genesis story, there are times when, when you ask yourself the question, does God really need to make more apple trees? It's a, it's a question that you, know, you can think about all afternoon. Is God still making more apple trees or more orange trees? Well, he can he, if he needed to. But in that story, in the Genesis story, he made, more, he made apple trees with the capacity to make more apple trees. He made fish with the capacity to make more fish. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 says that we were dead, and when we come to Christ and exchange our life, we are alive, so we are spiritually alive, and those things that he made every living creature spiritually and physically are given the capacity to make more of ourselves. He squarely puts that baton right in our hands. And so when we read these words, we th I think of a, a relay race. And I, so I brought some visuals with you this morning. And I, I want to show you uh, this track, if we can look at the next image. In a relay race, typically, you have a, a first leg, a second leg, a third leg, and a fourth leg. And there's runners at each of these. So when you think about what Jesus just said, and he said, I, as the Father put the baton in my hand, I'm putting the baton in your hand to put the baton in someone else's hand. You can kind of look at the track in this term, that the Father gave the baton to Jesus, who handed it off to us, who now hands it off to others. You see, when, when Jesus is speaking, he's saying, look, I'm, I want to give you the baton, but then he says something absolutely incredible, almost impossible to believe. In John chapter 14, he says these words, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me, who's exchanged the old life for the new one, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Okay, that, it, that in and of itself seems pretty steep because what Christ had been doing was miraculous. And now he says, you're going to be doing this too. But then he goes further and he says, he will do even greater things than these because my quarter track on earth is done. Now it's your time, and you will do greater things than I would. The fascinating thing about this is that when Christ came back from the dead, he distributed the Holy Spirit, he dispersed the Holy Spirit, so all around the world, we are seeing greater things because Christ was only in one location, but now that he's back from the dead, and now that the Holy Spirit lives in believers around the world, we are seeing tremendous work, greater than could have been done, right, and more than that little piece of real estate called Israel when, where Jesus walked. When we're looking at so many different countries around the world, in our case, over 100 countries, there are men and women doing things there that we could never dream to be doing as Americans, quite frankly. Those that are now in Iraq, those that are in Somalia, those that are in Sudan, those that, that places that I couldn't walk in, I couldn't cross the border. We have places in the world that I, that I won't even say publicly where, where they are, in very, very high places. We have people that are doing so much more greater things than we could ourselves. This is how God works. This is the strategy uh, of, the, of the relay race. When we look at the definition of our success as Christians, it is not what we have done, but what we've poured into others and what they are doing. In other words, a definition for success for followers of Christ is those who have come behind us, who we've invested in, who we've given the baton, and when they do greater things, they are defining our success. When we're doing greater things, we're defining, Jesus, we are giving you glory by, by doing the things you've assigned us to do. So my wife is uh, an avid Star Wars uh, fanatic, and uh, I'm not. So there's some tension there in the old household. And, uh, but I've given it, you know, being the good husband, I've given it a shot. I've, I've, you know, and you have to get the numbering system the, if for those. How many Star Wars fans do we have in the room? Come on. Don't, all right. There we go. All right. Yes. 
Uh, so, you know, the first Star Wars, the first real Star Wars movie is number four, right? Is that correct, all you Star Wars fans? You dare not say the real one is number one. I mean, that, the, the first one is one. It, it, it's a whole crazy system. But I've, been, you know, I've watched four, five, and six, and one, two, and three, and then seven, eight, and whatever. And, I, and it really angers her when I say, who's the guy in the black helmet? And, you know, just drives her up a wall. Now I do it on purpose, just to irritate her. Well, most of you recognize Yoda. Yoda said this. Yoda said these words. Pretty wise. We are what they grow beyond. We are defined what our disciples grow beyond. In other words, they're going to grow beyond us, and that defines who we are. This is why Paul, he was, a, he was a relay race runner. Watch. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, the very last chapter of the very last letter that we have, this baton runner is at the final steps of his quarter race, the quarter of his track. And these are the words he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race I have kept the faith. Now, if, you, if that's the only verse you ever read in the Bible, you think, well, it sounds like he was just a marathon runner, that he, that he ran the race, and he was just, man, he was just running on his own. But when you look at his story in total, you were, when you were recognized that when he says, hey, I have finished the race, it was a relay race because he put the baton in the hands of Silas and Timothy and Barnabas and so many others that rippled across the Corinthians, the Philippians, the Ephesians. He laid that baton in their hands. In fact, we see his heartbeat. I love this verse, Colossians 1, 28, 29. It's got both evangelism, sharing Christ, and disciple-making after a person comes to Christ. He said, we proclaim Christ. We proclaim him. That's sharing of our faith. But then he says, after people come to faith, then we admonish them, we warn them, we give them advice, we teach everyone with all wisdom. Why, Paul? Why do you do that? So that we might, at the end of time, present those who have grown up, those who are, are some versions of the Bible say perfect. It doesn't mean flawless. It means like a ripe tomato. They're, they're, they're mature. To this end, Paul says, this was the end of my race. This was the relay race. I wasn't just running this race by myself. Listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, my friends, God did not save us just to run a marathon race to see how great we can be, to see how holy we can be, to see how much in our lane we can run. God saved us and gave us new life so that we might share it with others and influence others and invest in others and pour into others so that at the end of time we'll stand there and watch those who have come behind us. This church collectively, you, we will stand at the Bema Seat of Christ and you will see those that you've influenced that you haven't even met before. You're going to see people that, with the support you've given to Japan, you'll see people in Japan standing before Christ, and that will define the strategy and the success that Christ wants in your life. I love this verse because it's both here and there in eternity. Paul said, to this end I struggle. I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. So I thought we would do something really practical. I love, I love big concepts, but man, I love something that I can hold on to. And so I want to, in the remainder of our time, just glean from a relay race some principles. And I feel like when, I, when, we, when we hear principles from the Word of God, I pray that one of these will whisper to you. I pray that one of these that typically, you know, when you give a list of things, maybe not everything applies to, to, to each person. But I do believe that God can use one of these things in each of our lives. So some principles that I want to lay out about a relay race. Now, I was, I was part of a track and field when I was in high school. And, uh, but to be honest with you, I, I uh, was the manager. That meant I, I uh, carried all the equipment. And the reason I did that is because if you were on the team, doesn't matter if you were running, jumping, or carrying the equipment, you got a letter, you know, on your coat. 
And when you got a letter on your coat, you have, you're, you're more uh, open to get a girlfriend. So that was why, I, that's my track and field. So I had to look up some things about a relay race, to be honest with you. But here's some things I think would be good for us to, to hold on to and to some practical things. Here's, here's the first thing. When you're in a relay race, the future runners are very intentional. You're in, la you're in lane three. You're on the starting blocks. And when, you, when that gun fires, they say, on your mark, ready, go, and you start running, the person that you're going to hand the baton to is not random. It's very, very intentional. You're running like crazy. You know exactly who that. You don't just come up and you're running into the lane and you're running all over whatever lane you want to pick and just hand it to somebody that's convenient. That's not how a relay race runs. In fact, if you hand it to a wrong person, game over, race over, right? You know exactly. In fact, you guys have trained a bit together. You've seen each other and how, how, how you've how you've operated, you've, you've rehearsed together, you've practiced together every afternoon. You know who that is. What do I mean by that? Here's where I think it's so important. We are given the opportunity to rub shoulders with one another in the body of Christ. We're, we're given the opportunity to rub shoulders with people in our neighborhoods, where we work, etc. The prayer is this. We, Pastor Roy said it Yesterday, as far as sharing our faith, I know you guys have talked about this. Who's your one? Who's your one? In other words, who are you going to be intentional about? Who's that runner you got your eye on in front of you? When it comes to disciple making, it's the same. When Jesus prayed for the disciples, he prayed all night. It says the, the Bible says that the, the disciples came to him and he chose 12 of them very intentionally. Now, sometimes I, I kind of smile when I read this, that, that Jesus prayed all night. Like, why did it take him all night to pray for those 12? I don't know. I'm not saying I die on this hill, but I just wonder at times, was the arm wrestling with the Father? Like, do I really have to take Peter on? I mean, come on. Do I, do I have, you know, the back and forth? I don't know. Probably not. But I do know this. It was very intentional. I want to look at Moses and Joshua today. Moses, Moses had a very unique calling on his life to move a nation from one place to the next. And when, and when he was going to say, who am I going to pour into? He noticed this young man, Joshua, and he said, I'm going to be very, very particular because we're reminded, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, I do not run like a, a man running aimlessly, randomly. We like to use the word organically. That makes us feel better. But I'm just running without purpose. I don't run like that. I don't fight like a man just beating the air without a target. So with each of these moments that we're going to look at, a, 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 at the relay race, I'm going to ask you a, a challenging question. Here's the first one. Who's in your lane? Who's in your lane? If you're in the first leg of the track, who's in the second leg of your track? I would challenge you. When it comes to disciple making, we often just let, it, let the person come to us. And if God just randomly puts someone in our path, then we say, then I'd be willing to disciple someone. I'd say reverse that. In other words, begin to pray, God, who do you have for me to pour into now? It really matters when we're intentional in our praying. That's the first gleaning. Here's the second thing about, uh, about a race, a relay race in particular. Both people are running. Both people are running. So when you run that first quarter track and you're coming up to the second, when, when, the, when you're getting close to that second runner, the second runner starts running. In fact, and I, I brought another diagram. If you look on the left, the guy in the blue is getting ready to hand it off to the guy in red. But when you look at the next, uh, the image, I've circled that middle, this is where the handoff, and by the time that baton reaches to the hand of the, of the second runner, that second runner has already started running. Why do I say that? 
Because not only do we want to be intentional in who we and who we're we're going we're looking at who that person is in our in the lane in front of us, we begin to observe different. When we're intentional, like, hey, who's in my life group? Who who's in the, in there that I'm like, man, I, I I want to pour into that person. Who's in a student ministry here? Who's who's that person that you're rubbing shoulders with? And then the criteria for that is that person, you're looking for a person that already has some motion in God. Be careful to not mistake disciple-making for I'm going to disciple someone that hadn't, hadn't been in church, they hadn't been running for about three or four months, and maybe if we start discipling, they'll start going. No, God says, hey, you're looking for people that are faithful. In fact, in Exodus chapter 17, as Moses began to look for his next runner, they're in the midst of war. The Amalekites, enemies of God's people at the time, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. So he's looking specifically at that next runner, Joshua. He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, tomorrow I'm going to stand at the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand, and I'm going to be praying for you as you begin to run as you begin to fight. The key verse for disciple-making in the New Testament is 2 Timothy chapter 2, and two, verse 2. And here we're told that all things, Paul saying, all the things I've, that you've heard in me, Timothy, say in the presence of many witnesses, I want you to put that baton into the hands of running men, of reliable men, of faithful men, not men that are standing there, not even with their hand out, but they, I'm, I'm looking for, for guys that are in motion. Why? Because it will be a higher chance of them putting the baton in the hands of someone else. These things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified, who will also be faithful in sharing others. In our own local church in, in Florida, we are now on our sixth generation of disciple-making. That means disciples who have made disciples, who have made disciples, who have made disciples, who have made disciples, who are now making disciples. The success rate for our disciples becoming disciple-makers is over 80%. It's because we're very careful to be intentional about who is in that lane in front of us, but also are they running because we want to put that, the baton in the hands of running of people who are going to hand that baton off? You want to make sure they're running and they're not at the snack bar. You want to make sure they're in motion. Does that make sense? It's very important. Here's another thing. That, that place where they, they change the baton, it's called the exchange zone. The exchange zone is a very defined space what do I mean by that you have no idea when your last breath is going to take place that is a very defined space in fact when you look at the, the, the race it's typically about 20 meters and that's it you cannot hand off the baton one inch beyond the exchange zone it's not allowed in fact, if you look in the upper right corner of that slide and you look at this that's divided into quarter tracks, this is your life. It's a very defined life. Your days are numbered. Your, your, your last breath is on God's calendar. As we've traveled through this pandemic, I, like you, have lost people that have been close to me. I've lost a, a, a great friend of many, many years. When my, uh, we moved to Sarasota two weeks in, my family moved in, my parents were in a car accident, and uh, we lost my dad in that car accident, and at the memorial service, there was a, an older man in my church, he, said, he came up to me and said, I'll be your dad, I'll be your grandkid, I'll be your, the granddad, uh, granddad to your kids, my kids weren't born at the time, I'll be, I'll be the granddad, and he will, every Sunday morning, He'd come in, and he'd have two quarters in his pocket. And he would take that quarter and give it to each of our boys. And one, one Sunday, my boy uh, gave him a little glass heart. And um, my friend Bob, he carried that heart everywhere he went and every day. We lost Bob and his wife during COVID. 
COVID has brought to us a reality, a reality that already existed, but it's accentuated. Every day of our life is a gift. What is fascinating in the story of Moses, it is, it is absolutely stunning, is that all that he put up with, griping and sand blowing in his face and and people not being happy and people you know saying hey we need to get another leader and he went through that one decade and two decades and three decades and four decades and then he got right to the finish line right to the promised land and god said you're not you're not going to go over in fact you're going to put that baton in that boy's hand named joshua Watch, the story is found in Deuteronomy 31. So Moses, he went and he spoke these things to all Israel. He'd just given a speech. He said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to come and go. And the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross this Jordan River. It is the Lord your God who will cross ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and you will dispossess them. Joshua your next runner. He's the one that's going to cross ahead of you just as the Lord has spoken. Listen, everybody's life is defined. Here's the challenging question. If not now, when? If not now, when? If you're not going to share the gospel now, then when do you plan to share it? If you're not going to come to Christ now, when do you plan to come? If you're not going to disciple now, when do you plan to disciple? God is a God of now. God is a God of urgency. Paul ran the race like it was his last day. Paul ran the race like he was in the last quarter every day of his life. And I think this is the encouragement for us. Be intentional about the runner in front of you. Make sure that runner has got some motion to him or her. Make sure you're picking somebody that's going to, you know, is going to take the baton. But recognize that the exchange zone, the handoff zone here, is quite limited. Here's something that is that's almost so simple we might trip over it. Every, every year there's track meets. Every year there are different runners. And here's the principle. The runners change. The track never does. In other words, God's plan of disciple-making was true when Jesus spoke the Great Commission. It was true 100 years after that. It was true in the year 312. It was true in the year 589. It was true in the year 715. It was true in 127. It was true in 1349. It was true in 1812, and it is true in 2011. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the things that I have commanded to you, and lo, I will be with you always. This is the great commission that is as fresh today as it is. The the track has not changed. Even though the runners do, that track never changes. You see, here's what happened in Joshua chapter 1. This is the death of Moses. At the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, uh, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. The track has not changed, Joshua. The plan has not changed, Joshua. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. And I will give you every place where you set your foot as I have promised Moses. See, in Isaiah 14, it's a riveting verse. In Isaiah 14, 24, the Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be. I'm not changing my mind. I'm not changing the plan. We only, the only way that human beings will do something greater than Jesus as he has promised is if we continue to put the baton in the hands of those around the world, in this city, in this community, in your neighborhood, within this church. It's the only way we'll ever accomplish what Jesus set out. He said, I, w- what I have planned, so it will be and w- as I have purposed, so it will stand. There is a promise that comes with this journey with his track at when joshua was getting ready to take the baton the lord gave this command to joshua son of nun be strong be courageous for you will bring the israelites into the land i promised them on the oath and the coach will always be there i will be 
and I myself. You see, God sends us to do some work, but there's some work that God continues to do in a track that never changes. I myself, God said, will be with you. Now, th this is where I'm going to talk to you as a pastor. Next year will be my 40th year in ministry. I understand that when it comes to disciple making or sharing your faith, that many people don't feel like they can do it. They don't feel adequate. They don't feel confident. They don't feel like maybe I don't know the Bible. And so when it comes to putting that baton in someone else's hand and think, you know what? I just don't know. Let me compassionately say this. If you're a Christ follower, you have a story. You not, may not be a theological scholar. You may not know even how to find the book of Ezekiel or how to spell Obadiah. But this one thing you know, you can put the baton in someone's hands and say, you know what? I was blind, but now I can see. That is your story if you're a Christ follower. I was walking in darkness, but now I'm walking in life. My appetite used to be for other things of the world, men. God changed my appetite. I didn't know where I was going. Now I know where I was going. I had no assurance with God, no peace with God. I have peace with God. I, don't, I, had, no, I, I had no love for God and no love for the Bible. Now, man, I can't wait to spend time with God. I, didn't, I, I had no purpose in my life. Now I got a purpose in my life. This is a baton that everyone can put in your hands. Don't allow the enemy to discourage you or even cause you to think falsely that you are not qualified God has qualified you when he stuck his, stuck his hand out to say welcome to the kingdom there was a baton in there waiting for you because God is with you God is with you just about the time that I think God can't do something or I can't do something God said don't forget I am with you you get that right at the death of Moses, Joshua, I'm sure. Why would God say be strong and courageous? Because he recognized that he was probably a little afraid at that point. And he said, I'll be with you. The Great Commission ends this way. Go and make disciples of all nations. And lo, I am with you to the end. He recognizes we're a little apprehensive. He gets that. One final thing. The story would end on an epic positive note if I stopped right here. But there is a sobering ending to this story. So Joshua did cross into the promised land. A lot of armies that were against God were conquered. The land was distributed to the tribes of Israel. Joshua led a faithful life. As we saw the death of Joshua, or Moses, we now see the death of Joshua at the end of his life in Judges chapter 2 and verse 8. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And after that, whole generation, Joshua's generation, had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done in Israel. Okay, wait a minute here. Are you saying, because there's sometimes I'm reading a Bible verse like that and it just stops me. I'm like, God, are you, are you saying that after the generation of Joshua that they had no idea who God was? And are you saying that nobody talked about the Red Sea and how the walls of a sea were held up while people walked through because it said they didn't know anything that he did. And you're telling me that no one shared about the, the water coming from a rock? And no one talked about the brazen serpent, serpent or, 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 or the bonanza buffet of quail? Or, or, or you didn't share about all the miracles and the presence of God? Nothing like that. You see, in this moment, it's so stunning to recognize that in a relay race, in the exchange zone, there is this moment where everybody gasps because in that moment, if the baton drops, the whole team 
loses the race. If my church, if the church God has given me to pastor drops the baton in Sarasota, Florida, we lose. But not only we lose, but people around the world lose. If we say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to that baton, you're, we're really dropping the baton. Trust me. There are people right here in Grace Fellowship Church that desperately need someone to walk with them at a table for two. We cannot afford to not pour into their lives just to tell them how great God is, to tell them how great God has been in your own life, and to leave that baton on the floor. This ought to be a place for us. It is an offering, an altar place to say, God, forgive me for dropping that baton you put in my hand. I'm going to ask you, God, to put it back. This baton is very, very simple. It's very, very simple. It's not complex. Welcome to the race. There's a baton in your hand. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you so much for the stunning reality that you have put a baton in our hands, that you have called us to a race, not just to run to see how well we can run it, but to run it for others, to consider others better than ourselves so that we might be defined, God, that the greatness will be defined not by what we do, but what our future runners will do. So God, would you whisper to our hearts in the only way that you can and help us to recognize, God, that you've given us a great privilege in this race. Help us to recognize that the exchange zone, our time, our quarter track, is very defined. Help us to be found faithful, God, in running this race for the glory of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name.